Archbishop Oscar Romero, who was a champion of the poor and prophet of peace and justice in El Salvador, was fatally shot on March 24, 1980, while saying Mass. Earlier in the service, he had read a portion from the Gospel of John, which read, Unless the grain of wheat falls into the earth and dies, it remains only a grain. But if it dies, it bears much fruit. And in his sermon, he had preached about the need to give one's life for others, as Christ did. <coughs> Archbishop Romero made the following observation. A church that doesn't provoke any crises, a gospel that doesn't unsettle us, a word of God that doesn't get under anyone's skin, a word of God that doesn't touch the real sin of our society in which it is being proclaimed, what gospel is that? <coughs> Previously, in the Acts of the Apostles. A lone beggar, known to many as having sat and begged at the gate called Beautiful, began his day as a panhandler and ended the day walking like a new man, leaping and praising God. Peter took the occasion of the astonishment and the confusion of the amazed crowd that gathered to preach and rather effective sermon, reminding the crowd that the beggar was healed in the name of Jesus of Nazareth, the one the crowd had asked to be crucified. But he was raised from death by God, and then passed on his authority to those that followed him and believed in his message. Peter told the crowd they had another chance, that they could change their minds, they could repent, and they could become followers of Jesus. And that message, that sermon, turned 5,000 people into members of the church. I don't think we have quite that many here this morning. But they took the opportunity to join with the fledgling members of, that, of those that followed Jesus and all that he taught. But that sermon disturbed the priests the captain of the temple, and the Sadducees. They were a bit miffed that they were that the disciples, Peter and John, were preaching about resurrection and about that troublemaker Jesus whom they thought they had gotten rid of. So that Peter and John were arrested and forced to make a court appearance the next morning. And that brings us to our reading this morning. They arrived at their court appearance, and the question that they are asked is, by what power, by what name did you heal this man? And there's a shift in the issues that they seem to be concerned about. Because when they were arrested the night before, the charge was they were preaching resurrection. And the Sadducees did not believe in resurrection. They were preaching about mercy, and they didn't like that. So these men were arrested because of preaching about healing, about resurrection, about the mercy of God. But now, the next morning, the issue is power. Why were they concerned about power? <laughs> First, they were concerned about power because they were the temple authorities, and they wanted to control that authority. They were jealous, and they jealously protected that authority that they had. The author of Acts is very much pro-temple and pro-religious institution. He doesn't relate this story to try and debunk the institutions of faith or the institutions of the church. But what he does is to remind us in this story that those in authority, those in the hierarchy of our ecclesiastical 
institutions need to remember who they are and whose they are and who we serve. Because even though it was an early church and they were not yet called Christian, they did have a working organization. They met regularly to study the scriptures. They had fellowship together. There were communal meals. There was prayer. They had financial accountability. They evangelized. They went out and taught about Jesus. And there were positive relations with the larger society around them. But this movement didn't answer the hierarchy. It didn't answer to a church authority. It didn't answer to the temple authority. They were powered by, driven by, led by the Holy Spirit. The early Christian movement was not interested in structures of authority, but in what did God lead them to do and to say when they were with each other. Peter, you notice, each time he is given the opportunity to speak, it always says, Peter, in the Holy Spirit said, God visits him. <coughs> Jesus had promised his disciples, when I leave you, don't be afraid what you will say to the authorities if you are brought before them, and you will be if you talk about me. Don't worry about that. You will be given the words to speak. And the lectionary which gives us this text this morning waits until Pentecost, which we observe on May 20th this year, to actually use Acts 1 as a reading that we know about the Holy Spirit arriving and the power that it brought into the church makes us ask the question today, in the year 2018, in all of the business of the church, and I'll use the big C church, regardless of denomination, regardless of which branch of Christian faith we come from, what do our leaders use as their guide? Are we worried more about church dogma and doctrine and constitutions and those institutions that human, humanity, people have set up? Or do we worry about being led by the Holy Spirit? Do we ask that God's presence be among us to lead us and to guide us and to take us somewhere? The other concern that the temple authorities had was a very different concern. Was it, it was a concern for the sacred. You see, we exist as a church. We exist as synagogue and temple. Not only to bring people to God. Not only to restore the relationships between human individuals and God but to protect people from the full, unmediated glare of God's glory. Remember back in the book of Exodus, God said to Moses, you cannot see my face and live. So when we approach God, when we approach the divine, when we come to worship and we hope to have an experience of God, it is always, there is an intermediary. We don't see God face to face. The power that the deity has would overpower us and be too much for us to handle. And you see, the temple authorities see what Peter and John and some of the other disciples are doing, the healing that they have giving blind men sight, the lame beggar is able to walk. And they see, 
that it's not something that these men could do on their own. They haven't been educated as doctors. They haven't been educated as scholars. But yet these men have a wisdom and a power about them that scares these other men because they don't understand it. And isn't that so much the same today for us? If someone has a deep faith and they're able to understand things, they're able to ex have experiences that we kind of wonder what's going on with them. Do we question ourselves? Is it because our relationship with God and the Holy Spirit is maybe not quite as close as we could be? Peter, in answer to the temple authorities, responds, we have healed this man in the name of one person only, in the name of Jesus the Christ, because he has given us power, he has given us authority, and we're able to do it only through him. We're not doing this by ourselves. This passage also is something that we need to pay attention to when he says, only through this power in the name of Jesus can our Bible say save, but that same word that is used as saved also means healed. We heal the beggar, we heal the blind people, we heal the sick in the name of Jesus. And that Jesus gives us what we need. But so often in the 2,000 years since the time of the disciples, this text has been used to malign people of other faiths. And I know for some, this may be controversial, that it is only in and through Jesus Christ that we can be saved. But that's where the Gospel of John comes into play for us. Because John says, I have sheep of another flock. They're in a different fold. They will come to me. They will hear my voice. So, in the Gospel of John, Jesus is telling his followers and telling us that the invitation to relationship with God can be through him, and there are other ways of worshiping, other ways, pathways to God, that we should not think that the one we are in, for this church, the United Church of Christ, for others it may be the Roman Catholic tradition, for others it may be a Baptist tradition. Jesus said, I have sheep in another fold. There are other ways to practice faith. There are many ways for us to practice our faith. It's not just one way and one way only, but that we have in our tradition, Jesus. <coughs> and Jesus will call to God and God will call to God's self others from throughout this world. And our brothers and sisters in the Jewish faith particularly have been persecuted for millennia because their faith, we think, is different. They're not Christian. But my friends, we came from the Hebrew tradition. The Hebrew people had salvation. 
the Hebrew people had God. God had a covenant with them. We have been given the opportunity to be part of that covenant through Jesus. We are that other fold. <coughs> we are those who have been drawn into relationship with God. If we have heard Jesus' voice, if we are willing to step up and to follow him. Sometimes the gospel invitation is taught and is preached as narrow. But God allows for much more grace and much more mercy than we give God credit for. We want to preach that if you don't follow my way, that you're going wrong. The institutions of religion all want to preserve themselves just like the temple authorities and they want to jealously guard the pathway to salvation. And our lesson for this morning is that Jesus blows that open. The Good Shepherd, if we follow the Good Shepherd, if we hear a shepherd's voice, if we hear God's voice, we are given an invitation. We are given an opportunity to change, to be transformed, to come back to relationship with God. My dear friends, may God add God's blessing to these people's words.